Guten Tag und herzlich willkommen im Literaturhaus Berlin Online. Mein Name ist Sonja Longolius. Ich begrüße Sie sehr herzlich zu Lesung und Gespräch mit Peter Santing, der heute aus den Niederlanden zugeschaltet ist. Er hat uns seinen neuesten Roman nach Matthias mitgebracht, der ins Deutsche übersetzt wurde von Hanni Ehlers. Heute unterhält sich Peter Santing mit der Journalistin und Radiomoderatorin Sophie Derksen und ich wünsche uns und Ihnen allen viel Spaß. Liebe digitale Gäste des Literaturhauses Berlin, liebe Zuhörer, herzlich willkommen auch nochmal von mir. Wie erwähnt, ich bin Journalistin zurzeit in Amsterdam, aber habe lange Zeit in Berlin und Hamburg gearbeitet. Und die deutsch-niederländische Beziehungen sind also eine rote Fahne in meiner Biografie. Und ich freue mich denn auch sehr, Ihnen heute diesen niederländischen Autor vorstellen zu können. Peter Santing, herzlich willkommen, lieber Peter. Herzlich willkommen. Hi. Erstmal. Hi. Erstmals vorweg, und das mache ich jetzt noch auf Deutsch, wir haben uns wegen der Sprachebarriere auf einen Kompromiss geeignet. Sie kennen uns für unsere Kompromisse. Das Pseudomodell ist auch in Deutschland berühmt, weiß ich mittlerweile. Und zwar, dass ich Ihnen das Buch erst kurz auf Deutsch vorstelle und das Gespräch mit dem Autor, mit Peter Santing, dann auf Englisch führe. Gut, dann würde ich sagen, legen wir los auf Deutsch erstmals. Nach Matthias ist der dritte Roman von Peter Santing, aber der erste, der jetzt auf Deutsch erschienen ist, und zwar bei Diogenes Verlag, schon erwähnt in diese wundervolle Übersetzung von Hanni Elas. Ähm, Im Mittelpunkt dieser Roman steht Matthias, ein junger Mann, der in einer nicht weiter benannten Stadt lebt, äh, zusammen mit seiner Freundin Amber. Er ist ein fröhlicher Typ, hat immer sehr viele Pläne und will zum Beispiel mit seiner guten Freund Quinten demnächst einen Kaffeeladen öffnen. Doch von einem Tag auf den anderen ist Matthias nicht mehr da. Wir werden ihn kennenlernen und zwar nur kennenlernen durch die Beschreibungen der Hinterbliebenen. Acht Menschen, deren Leben wegen Matthias Tod eine andere Richtung einschlagen. Zusammen geben dann ihre Geschichte uns Antwort auf die Frage, was ist mit Matthias passiert und allgemeiner, welche Lücke hinterlässt ein Mensch, wenn er stirbt. Lieber Peter Santing, wir freuen uns, ich freue mich, dass du heute quick, lebendig bei uns bist für dieses Kennenlernen. Nochmals herzliche Wirkung, Peter. Ja. Um, ich schalte dann jetzt um aufs Englisch. Um, Peter, you write novels. This is your third one, um, but you also work as a deputy editor in chief for uh, the Dutch newspaper NRC Handelsblatt, um, the mm -hmm. weekend magazine. From the very beginning of your career, you have combined your work as a novelist with journalism. Why? And yeah. is it a necessary combination in order for you to be able to write? I wouldn't say it's necessary. Um, I would just say that it was a coincidence um, in the respect that I started writing in 2010. I just started writing. That was the thing that I was doing. And I ended up um, doing these two very different, but also kind of similar uh, kind of writing. So I, I started doing the journalism. Uh, uh, I started my, my career in journalism that year. So 10 years ago this year, and I started writing on my first novel. Um, I guess I just had the ambition to write. And yeah, well, simultaneously, I think I started writing on my first novel in March of that year, and I started like six months uh, later at the newspaper. Um, but also, uh, let's not forget that there are a lot of similarities between the two. Of course, there's the big difference uh, uh, between it all having to be true um, when practicing journalism and it all uh, uh, be me being able to make up, made up, uh, make up a lot of stuff when, 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 when writing novels. Um, there's also the similarity of just telling a story and engaging the reader. And in some cases, also in journalism, making use of plot, of uh, characters, of uh, suspense sometimes, of dialogue, of scenes. And I think that if you uh, practice those tools, then you can just uh, use them in both kinds of writing. Mm. And what is more rewarding for you, if you um, 
I would say that longevity, like the the uh, writing something that stays that stays behind, uh, uh, also one of one of the things that I try to do with the book and try to write about in the book. Um, you know, you want to tell stories that stay. You want to tell stories that are not forgotten the next day, um, and that that stay with with people. Um, but that's not to say that that's not the case with journalism. You can write some great stories, uh, or colleagues of mine who have uncovered some some great uh, truths that otherwise we would not have known about that uh, that have a long um, memory with people and especially grief i guess as being a very important theme for your book um, mm -hmm. is a theme that is really good to be transported through a novel i guess maybe even better than through a news report or a longer yeah. long read yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm convinced of that. Yeah, grief is uh, has been a part of uh, well, ex at least two, but maybe even all three of my novels, but most, uh, most explicitly in in the last one in Nachmatias. We will talk further on that subject later, I guess. I would like to stay uh, to to start first with introducing this third novel of yours, um, now being able uh, um, for, for, for German readers to read as well. Um, you got the idea for this book in 2015, I read, um, whilst sitting in a waiting room at Dublin Airport, uh, about <laughs> to board your yeah. flight. Um, yeah. Can you describe that initial moment? Uh, what happened? Yeah, you know, there are always moments almost every day when someone something strikes you as um, as having some uh, there's a thought that you want to hold on to and maybe it's something maybe you throw it away a week later or but this one um, that happened with so I was in Dublin airport I had been there for my uh, work as a journalist and I'd been to a tech conference in Dublin and I was waiting in at the airport for my flight home and you know the the, the big airports being behind the, the really big windows uh, with the futuristic uh, uh, chairs lined up and uh, and the group of people waiting for um, for boarding the plane to board the plane and what happened was I was just looking at my plane and I, I guess they were cleaning it up um, before us being able to board the plane and I and I thought what if, what if we what if we crash um, and I I don't have really a fear of flying but I think that that is a thought that many people have uh, just before boarding a plane. You, you mean, I mean, after all, you're just in a building on its side being thrown from one place to another. And then um, I, oddly enough, the first thing that I thought about was, well, I do have this doctor's appointment tomorrow morning, so I'll miss that. Um, Nothing serious, I hope. No, no, no but that was just just a strain in my back there was a muscle in my back that was that was aching and i and i, I had an appointment for that it was nothing nothing serious turned out to be nothing serious even um so what i thought was tomorrow morning if this plane crashes tomorrow morning that doctor will just go into his waiting room call out my name and there will not be anyone i will not be there so what happens what does this man do does he just call out the name of his next patients uh, patient, uh, does he go back to his to his to his little office? Does he play a game on his phone? Does he go for a walk? Does he does he go for lunch a little bit earlier? Either way, whatever happens, I'm not there, and his life alters in a tiny little bit. So that that got me started. Um, uh, someone dying has many 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 more consequences than just what you would define as grief. Um, there could be friendship. There could be uh, all kinds of different things happening just because of someone not being there from one day onto the other. Um, so that really was the starting point, and and from then from then on, I um, I uh, I became I, I I started to think up of other stories that would would be happening uh, to people knowing this one person not being there anymore, um, or not really knowing him, but their life just being all the, all the same. Yes. Um, let's, let's start first by this central figure that you made up, that you came up with, Matthias. Um, mm, yeah. In your book, we hear nine different voices speaking about him, uh, about who he was, how he has left a mark on their lives in very different ways, as you just described yourself. Um, would you still say Matthias is the protagonist of the story? 
I mean, he's um, passed away. He's already dead on page one. Right. Yeah. I wouldn't say he's a protagonist, but he is the main character. And I think there's a difference in that. He's the main character, but he has died even before you reach page zero. So, mm. um, and he is the main character, uh, but all the other people, the nine people that you then encounter as a reader, they tell you about him, but also they tell you about themselves because that's that's an important thing I I think to 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 establish that um, even when someone is dying and even when it's someone close to you and even when there's very very much grief we don't become like a a museum of grief for the person not knowing uh, of not being there anymore uh having died because we live our own lives and we tell our own story so i i really really wanted to be eight or nine uh, protagonists for themselves telling you as a reader not only how they knew matthias or uh, or anything like that but telling their own story and how they cope with it, but also how they cope with their own lives and their own problems and their own demons. Mm. We'll get to those figures, of course, as well. But yeah. first, maybe Matthias, um, how would you describe him yourself? I mean, we get to know him through many different characters, eight, eight people. But what would you say is his main feature? He was on uh, in, in one of the scenes. He's with Quinton. He's, that's that's his best friend, um, and they were on a, a kind of like like festival in the city. And there was this big sign in one of the scenes. In, in uh, and 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 on the sign it says "Make no little plans," and and I think uh, I put it in there because I uh, in in my mind Matthias already had uh, that kind of a view of, of of life, and also um, maybe even after that, after reading it like that, like that's, that's my goal. He was av adventurous and he was the, the one with the, with the big plans and not, not, not being, um, uh, not being afraid to, to mess it up or to fail, just start off again. And in that way, he's, he's maybe kind of some, someone I would, I would in some respect like to be myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm less adventurous than Matthias is or was, I think. Hmm. So he is the central figure, but then you, you were intrigued by this phenomenon of how, how a sudden death, his in this case, touches other people's lives. Yeah. Did you know immediately that you wanted to write a, a mosaic novel, I guess is the term in, in English? Well, uh, you maybe could say that it was a natural point for me to end up with uh, because I wrote uh, my debut novel from just one point of view and then my second novel was from two points of view. So I would just have to have even more in this book. Um, but I, yeah, I knew very early on. And the main reason I guess for that was that I just, I really, really, really wanted to uh, write like, because I, I thought it would be fun. I thought it would be fun to make up eight or nine or 10 little, if in first case, even 12 little lives or whole lives, but in, 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 in little chapters, like 20 pages, 25 pages, I would, give you as a reader a slice of their life at uh for every character a a pivotal moment in their life a a, a moment in which something happens some turn has to be made um and i um I, I wanted to do it all i wanted to 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 have them all have a, a an own unique style of telling a, a style of talking i wanted to write about uh people who went who, Quinto went to Afghanistan uh, to be a soldier for the mil military. Uh, another one, he's blind, and I, I wanted to write from the point of view from someone who is blind. Another one is a mother uh, uh, grieving herself, and I. Um, an another one are uh, are two old people. They're they're past their eighties, and I wanted to have all those point of view mainly because I I, I wanted to see if I could do it. Yeah, it's interesting that you call it fun, because to me, it seems like mainly an enormous puzzle to create such a novel. I read yeah. you used small notes written on cards scattered around you on the floor in order to keep an overview right. of all those narratives. Yeah, um, but puzzling is fun, Sophie. <laughs> puzzling is fun, but it can be a struggle writing. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was a struggle sometimes. It wasn't in the beginning because this this was what I did. I wrote down uh, te little li lyrics from songs or places that I came up with that some scene could be happening or uh, character traits uh, or 
all kinds of things, names, and then I just put them together in little piles. So, so here I have a name, I have a character trait, I have a way of uh, how she dresses, I have a way of how her, her hair looks, I have a place that she's been, I have the place that she lives, I have a song that she loves, and then I had these little characters made up of those of those uh, uh, those memory those those cards. Um, it was a puzzle. I, I even made like kind of like solar systems of, of how all these characters are behaving um, in respect to one another. Who knows who, who doesn't know who, but uh, uh, who crosses whose uh, path. Um, and also then I would just say that, 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 I, that I had a lot of fun doing that. Of course, when you're in, at the end and you have to you have to make it all fit together, you you stumble across two or three points that you see are not really working ideally. So, so in the end, uh, I, I yeah I struggled with 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 one or two really really uh, difficult chapters, especially the first one with Amber um, to to really get it right because she's the one who knows Matthias the best and she's the one who should be able to tell you as the reader uh, who he was the best. Uh, but I, but I think that's true for any book that doesn't really have to do with the fact that I chose eight or nine points of points of view. Mm. Peter, I guess this is a wonderful point to, to listen to this first phrases of the book, to hear the okay. voice of yeah. Amber, um, to get an idea of the book and to hear the, the words that she tries to find for her complicated emotion. Um, let's, let's listen. It will be read to us in the German translation. Amber. Eine Woche nach Matthias wurde sein Fahrrad geliefert. Der Bote war ein ganz Aufgeweckter, der schon losredete, als sich noch gar nicht alle Türschlösser geöffnet hatte. Vor dem Eingang schlitzte er den Pappkarton an den Rändern auf und bimmelte zweimal mit der Klingel. Ich stellte das Fahrrad in den Flur und ließ die Türschlösser wieder zuschnappen. In den Tagen darauf musste ich mich an dem Fahrrad vorbeizwängen, wenn ich nach draußen wollte. Auf die Frage von Besuchern, Leuten, die meine Sachen gewaschen hatten oder wieder mal eine Topfpflanze mitnahmen, antwortete ich, das sei Matthias neues Fahrrad. Da fragte dann keiner weiter. Konnte ich sie bitten, gar nichts mehr zu fragen? Trauer ist wie ein Schatten, der richtet sich nach dem Stand der Sonne, fällt morgens anders als abends. Der lehnt dunkel und geduldig an der Wand, streckt sich in voller Länge über den Asphalt aus oder zeichnet hinter deinem Rücken die Silhouette einer graziös drohenden Schlange auf den zu lange nicht gemähten Rasen. In diesen ersten Wochen wusste ich manchmal nicht, ob ich meinen eigenen Schatten sah oder den von jemandem, der sich mit den besten Absichten dicht neben mich gestellt hatte. Ich brachte das Fahrrad ins Wohnzimmer. Peter, you just told us that um, Amber's voice, Amber's character was one of the more difficult ones to create. Why was it so difficult? Mm -hmm. um, and did you know from the beginning that the book had to start with her perspective? Yeah, I knew from the beginning that the book had, yeah, because she was the one um, uh, dealing with the grief. And also she was the one who would be able to tell you about Matthias the best uh, especially in the in 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 the later life the later uh, years of his life because you also hear his mother in the fifth or sixth uh, uh, chapter um, but amber yeah she she would introduce matthias to you as the reader also um, when you begin reading this book and you don't know anything about it you don't know if you be a, Uh, going to another character in in a page for 10 or 20 or you'll be staying with Amber. So for all the reader knows, this is the voice he or she will be reading for the rest of the, the 200 pages. So that I guess that made it difficult. It, it, it raised the stakes. Sorry? I said it better be good. Yeah, it better be good. It raised the stakes. It has to be good because if this chapter didn't work, all the other chapters um, maybe in vain maybe written in vain because the reader would not be able to read on so that was the one thing and then there was another thing um in one of the early versions of the book i had a relationship between amber and uh, matthias that was kind of like almost fairy tale like they were they were almost a perfect couple and um 
I don't know why I didn't see that in the first or in the th second version of me writing it. I ended up like uh, writing like f five versions of the book, um, but that was one of the flaws it had in that in that uh, period in time. So I, which wasn't that interesting. You wanted you wanted to also see where where things did not always go that well between these two people. They 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 ha they had to uh, have their their problems so that that also took me a while to figure out what was it what was it that uh, made them um uh people with flaws because we want to read we don't want to read about a perfect couple and then that 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 gets separated by death of course not the thing would just be that they are flawed people just like you and me and everybody else and and but they try to work through it nonetheless and uh, and that would be all the more better for the story. And then uh, and then to have Matthias not be there dying, and 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 then to have Amber react to that, and how would she deal with that? It it took me like I guess a month before I uh, uh, I had the, the the definitive version of the book. I I, I still sat here on my uh, on, on my couch in the living room writing that chapter. Hmm. An important image you came up with for this grief, Amber's grief, um, is, is the one that we just heard. Just grief being like a shadow that changes with the position of the sun. Auf Deutsch nochmal, Trauer ist wie ein Schatten, der richtet sich nach dem Stand der Sonne, fährt morgens anders als abends. Um, you told me, or I read somewhere, it, it's the most quoted sentence of the book. Um, you just told us that music is very important for you. Was it music that, that brought this image to you? Yeah. Um, what I sometimes do is I, 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 I also, just like I told you, uh, I wrote down some, some, some lyrics sometimes that I, that I thought could fit one character or would be their favorite song or anything, or have a place, a role in the book. Music plays an important part in the book. And then, uh, there was this one song by Sylvian Stevens, um, uh, and it's about the shadow. It it has a, it has a beautiful lyric about a shadow, and I, I was listening to that. And and what I sometimes do is I, I I try to have some when I when I don't have a really big uh, piece of the book to work on, but I want to have something down on paper anyway. I just want to try out new ideas. I do something that I like to call like lightning rounds <laughs> and and in and what i do is i have it's four or five words, really words. yeah sorry no i i just made the german translation i guess blitzrunde or so yeah 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 blitzrunde yeah uh and um i i have like four or five uh words and i i, I take one minute and uh with that one word as my association i tried writing and i did that with shadow and i i i I just went on writing for 60 seconds and then uh, my my timer went off and I took 30 seconds and then I went on with with, with the next word and sometimes when I do that um, I find that I that I uh, uh, can come up with with something that sticks with something that has has something that 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 can grow into something new and uh, and the the trauer is wie ein Schatten that was that was one of the things that came out of the lightning round. <laughs> I think we already just thinking about grief very... and think, yeah. No, I, I wanted to say I think we already found out that you're a very systematic and disciplined writer. Um, just making short assignments for yourself and then ending up with with those uh, strong images as the one we've just heard. Um, I want to listen to another voice from the book. Um, it's the one of Nathan. We will hear you reading in Dutch, um, just in order to give the audience an uh, impression of how your book sounds in its original version. Yeah. Would you say there's anything the German audience needs to know in advance before listening? Uh, no, 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 that's you can just uh, there was a plant falling down here. That's OK. No, just Don't let's listen that. to it. Will do. Ik moet iets drinken. Een Erdinger het zou nog het beste zijn. Troebel goud in een lang, sierlijk halve liter glas met vrouwelijke rondingen. Wat ik ook nodig heb, een gemeten dagtemperatuur in de beeld die niet hoger is dan 15,2 graden Celsius. Wat het voorlopige maand gemiddelde voor de maand mei op 13,1 zou houden en daarmee in elk geval niet hoger dan dat van 2014. 
En als we dan toch bezig zijn, een elektrische locomotief, serie E186 van de Nederlandse spoorwegen, NS van fabrikant Merklin, voor het H0-spoor, 229,99 euro. Eentje met twee onbeschadigde kop- kortkoppelingen graag om het model dat nu inactief bij mijn oogstperon staat te vervangen. Maar zo'n Erdinger die voorop. Een grote slok niet inhouden en weten dat je alsnog ruim overhoudt. Niet zoals bij zo'n armetierig Hollands fluitje. Hou op hoor. Eén teug en je zit op de bodem. Waarna je lot alweer in handen ligt van een serveerster met zwarte blouse en zwarte sloof. Met grote steekzakken die toevallig nooit je kant op kijkt. Nee, royale hoeveelheden Burgondisch, Duits, bier. Ze komen weliswaar ons strand omploegen, maar verdorie modeltreinen maken. En bier brouwen. Dat kunnen ze. Ik zal moeten wachten. Ik kan hier niet weglopen. Names, uh, there was Merklin trains, um, but also Erdinger Weissbier, very mm-hmm. important for this character Nathan. Um, he yeah. has a very well. I, I would describe him as someone with a an alcohol problem. Um, why did you want to create someone like Nathan? Why did you want to, to put yourself in this challenge of writing for an alcoholic? in that matter? Uh, because it's fun to just uh, go into other heads and try to write from that point of, of view. And, and, and also, uh, I, I, I guess I, I don't know if I could write from the perspective of a drug addict, for, for instance. I, I, I think I can, uh, yeah, I thought that I could imagine being an alcoholic and being that attracted to to the feeling of, of uh, that alcohol gives you. So I that was that was a challenge for me. And also Nathan was a challenge because I wanted to write from the point of view of someone who didn't know Matthias at all. There are people reading yeah. the book um, even now in from German readers. I sometimes hear of people reading the book and then landing on Nathan somewhere somewhere in the middle and then just asking themselves why are they why why am i reading about this guy because he doesn't seem to be have having anything to do with matthias at all uh but i wanted to do that because at that point you have some people very close to nathan uh, his grandparents uh, uh, his his best friend his girlfriend and then then there's this guy and i wanted the reader to be um curious as to how those two paths uh, uh would cross And we're not going to spoil that one, right? Uh, no, let's not. <laughs> They'll find out. But this, this Nathan is someone who just, well, has a brief encounter with, with someone out of Matthias' life. Um, that's something you found very important, I understood. Um, but as well, that there would be a great variety in your characters, that there would not be... Uh, kind of a certain tone of voice uh, for all of them, but, mm-hmm. but a very specific one. There's also a uh, character with the, a migrant background. Why did you want him to be in yeah. the book? Uh, it's a her, actually. Um, the point of view is from Sorry, a migrant yeah, yeah. Uh, mother. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to have the voices of a different... Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, speaking about the son uh, who has a little boy has some asthma and then uh, when he's grown up he uh, um, you, you hear his mother talking about him in 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 his youth and and how he is now and then um i wanted to write from her point of view because i wanted to have a very different set of characters that's one but also you know in the same period that i started uh, uh thinking about this book I also started doing some volunteer work here in utrecht in the netherlands and i i went every monday to an evening where i talked to refugees just having come to the netherlands from afghanistan sometimes or iraq or syria or sometimes other countries sometimes it was nepal or some someone from from france just having a job here but most of the times it, it, it was refugees people who came here and um I, I, I didn't go there to do some research on my book. That definitely was not my first thought when, when doing it. But but after a couple of months and after reading the book, or uh, writing the book, I, I also discovered that I was that that uh, the stories that I was hearing and the impressions that I was getting from those people, the feeling that I was getting from uh, from talking to them, it started to to find its way into my writing. 
so I wanted to have a character that uh, um, that resembled uh, some of the people that I, it's not what one on one, but resembled some of the characters characteristics that I saw in those people. Uh, and I wanted another character, the mother of Matthias, uh, to do some volunteer work like I did because I wanted her to uh, to encounter that world with the same uh, curiousness and um, uh, as, as I as I had. What I find intriguing is that you mentioned a couple of times that you would be able or would not be able to identify with, with your character. So Matthias, Nathan, you said, yeah, I could imagine myself being in their position in a way. Makes me wonder, how do you relate to your characters? Do they offer you virtual lives as some sort of an escape or, or to your own uh, existence or do you rather identify with them? Um, I guess it's, uh, yeah, they offer me, may, maybe the, the most true of what you just said would be just be the, 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 the thing about the, the characters being, uh, uh, giving me the ability to live their lives for a little bit. Um, but when you read the book, you also may find that I wrote sometimes from the first point, uh, the, the, the first person point, point of view, the, 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 the character talking to you as, as I did this or I see this, and then sometimes the, the third person. Um, and, uh, and that kind, kind of came naturally, but the two mothers are, uh, are, are both from the third person point of view. I write about them and about them and uh, 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 handling and I also go into their heads. I, I, as a writer, have a camera in their heads into what they're thinking and what they're feeling. But there was a slight difference in that. And I, maybe that's just me thinking now, maybe that's the difference between me being able to really identify or me being somewhat more of an observer of my character. So you would say you rather identify with the mothers? No, I, I the mothers. I I think I would be more of an observer, just trying really my best to to uh, to understand their behavior and what they're thinking, and getting into their thinking and getting into what they do, given the situations that I throw them into. Um, while while with Nathan, uh, for instance, uh, or the boy who, who who works as a roadie for a rock band. Uh, it was easier for me to just get into their head and, and look through their eyes. There was there's a slight difference, maybe. Mm. But but I in but in but in both the cases, just to uh, sorry, but in, in both of the in, for all my characters, it's the same that I I just I want I, I want to find out what they're thinking. I want to find out how they would react to a certain uh, certain uh, situation, and uh, and I want to make them believable for you as a reader. Mm. I think this is a very good moment to listen to this voice of the, the mother, the second mother in the book. Uh, it's Christiane and it's Matthias' mother. And again, we will listen to a German passage. Amber fragt, ob sie böse ist. Es ist der vierte Tag. Sie sitzt auf dem Sofa des Hauses, wo seine Post zugestellt wurde, wo sein Fahrrad im Wohnzimmer steht, wo er am Muttertag im Bett liegen blieb. Böse? Ja, das ist sie. Sie kocht vor Wut, weil Amber hier inmitten seiner Sachen wohnt und die Einzige ist, die den Haustürschlüssel hat. Sie schleicht durch die Räume und sucht nach Orten, wo etwas von ihm eingeschlossen ist, nach Gläsern, deren Deckel sie aufschrauben kann, damit er daraus aufsteigt. Nach den Verästelungen, die sein Lebenslauf in den letzten Jahren ausgebildet hat. Jahren, in denen er wochenlang nichts von sich hören lassen konnte und, wenn sie ihn schließlich anrief, behauptete, er habe wahnsinnig viel um die Ohren, aber er könne nicht so viel von sich erzählen, denn bei ihm sei alles wie immer. »Ein Brötchen?« fragt Amber. »Nein, noch immer kein Appetit. Zu Hause ist die Katze die Einzige, die etwas isst.« In besseren Momenten zählen sie beide auf, woran sie sich erinnern was ihnen gerade einfällt, wie Steinchen, die man in einen Teich wirft. Sie sitzen mäuschenstill nebeneinander und warten, bis die Kreise immer weiter werden und bei der anderen etwas Neues an die Oberfläche steigt. Etwas, von dem sie beide nicht mehr wussten, dass sie es behalten haben. Nein, meine Liebe, ich bin nicht böse. 
Worüber sollte ich böse sein? Yeah, Peter, I totally would agree with you that the book is absolutely not a book about grief, but it's mainly more than slices of life. Uh, but still, grief is a very important theme in the book. Mm -hmm. um, in at least two and maybe all three of your works, uh, you address this theme of, a, of, a, of death, of a sudden death. Um, why did you want to write another book about this heavy theme in a very light tone, be it so? Yeah, yeah, in in a in a at times hopeful and optimistic tone, I I, I agree. But uh, but nonetheless, and 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 maybe I I myself not all, not not always understand how this came to be. But nonetheless, this is my uh, th th this is not the first book I I, I wrote about grief and the, and the many uh, many instances of grief. Um, I wouldn't say that I myself am thinking about my own death a lot i am definitely not i i wouldn't say that i am uh prone to be uh uh depressed or pessimistic about myself or about the world of our, or or about my life but i do think that this uh, notion of not knowing when it ends um just fascinates me and 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 keeps me uh keeps me busy um and i think it it's I guess it's um, writing in a way is a way for me to be immortal. That sounds that sounds maybe um, uh, more more grotesque than I mean it, but it but 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 I I think there's a there's a kind kind of trueness to it, and it's a way to deal with the not knowing how, not knowing why, not knowing when. Writing about it is is a way to to uh, to grab it and um, and to. Uh, to own a little slice of death until <laughs> until death one day will own me. Hmm. But still, I mean, you just said you needed, well, it, it costed you most effort to really find the, the voice for the, the, the ones who were severely grieving, Ember and, and Christiane, the mother of Matthias that we just heard. Um, I was just curious when it's not a deep felt uh, personal experience, this grieving, I was curious how you dare to write about this complicated state of being. How come you felt confident enough to do so without having experienced yourself? It seems not just specific yeah, and complicated. I, it is. It is specific and it is complicated and it is a daring thing to do. I agree, but I don't think that the only person, uh, per, the only people being, should be able to write about death who have, who have uh, uh, find it out firsthand. Uh, I think uh, one of the main things that we as writers, but also we as a, pe as a people need to do is, is be empathetic and, and being able to look into each other's heads and, um, and, um, and being able to recognize the, the demons that other people are fighting and listening to other people's stories and, and, um, and find a way to be relative about your own. Uh, and I think that, that, that goes, that, that goes for this also. I, I, I wanted to have empathy for my characters and I wanted to be inside their heads when someone, uh, when something like this happened and then, um, uh, and then see how to deal, deal with it. And I, I don't think I would overstep a boundary there. I, I think I created a character and I, I, I lived with him or with her for, for the better part of two years. And, um, and I, I, I tried as best as I could to be, um, uh, to also in in how they cope with grief, to be em em empathetic with them, even though they're not real, and to be believable as them. And there's this this image that you have in the book, a story, very strong one, I guess, of this young girl building a sand castle. I mean, we know all that the water will come, but the question, of course, is what remains. You just uh, touched upon that as well. I was wondering, do you think that Matthias? had any thoughts on how people would remember him? Oh, well, that's something that I did not really No, I, I don't think I don't think that was well, he, he would have if if by life you had asked him, I'm, I'm sure he would have come up with a nice answer because he was a smooth talker kind of a little bit. Um, but uh, I don't think it's it's something that he himself out of out of his own instinct would be thinking about a lot. You know, we have uh, a funny th thing about the, 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 the sand castle is I had the idea for the book and then I went on uh, on a holiday to Malaysia uh, for, for three weeks just before writing the book. And then and, and 
it was there that I saw the sand castle and and the water rising and the sand castle being slowly uh, demolished and um, and I thought it was a a wonderful um, image of uh, of uh, having built something if you want to see your own life also as something that you build until one day the water rises the tide comes in and uh, and slowly slowly uh, uh, picks at it and and tries to get it down um, and and I I thought about the little girl or the little boy that would have built uh, the sandcastle that day and would be home in bed um, uh, uh, not knowing what re what would remain would she or he return the next day that's definitely a very strong image uh, when it comes to what what remains um, this mm. question being important for you obviously uh, how do you deal with it in your own life do you keep diaries or, or yeah, I, uh, I I I, I right. do try to capture moments. Yeah, yeah, I do try to capture a lot. Uh, I think I uh, uh, writing this book or writing any of my books for that for that matter is a way, as I said, to be uh, making something that would be longer lasting than I myself might be. Um, but I also. I write in diaries. I have a son; he's one year old, and uh, and, um, and 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 for him, but also just for the, for the last five or six years, I've been writing in a diary, just capturing moments that I that I and I that I don't want to slip through the cracks, even though I know deep down that they will slip through the cracks because the um, just as you don't really know what pain feels like uh, unless you feel pain at the at the moment or you don't really know what a strawberry tastes like uh, uh, except for the moment you are tasting a strawberry you it, it's hard to capture it it's hard to capture the real feeling of of pure joy uh, when uh, when something happens or uh, or pure pure agony when something bad happens um, so I, I guess there's there's two things. There's there's the um, the, the ambition to just remember and and hold up, hold on to everything that I know I will not be able to do, and then there's uh, there's this little part of me that that maybe uh, thinks it's enough just to have the feeling that I try to do it, and that I try to hold on to things, and that I that I that I have the ability to go back two years from now and uh, and see what I was thinking back then or, or, or seeing a picture um, uh, or, or writing a book like this, which, um, which gives me a way to, to exist outside of myself. And, and interesting is, I guess, um, a phrase that you used in the book uh, about Amber and, and Matthias being both children of the 90s. You yourself are, I guess, a child of the 80s mainly, but still this could apply to you as well, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. A remarkable phrase from Ember, I will read, read it in, in German. Wir waren Kinder der 90er Jahre. Zu uns sagten sie, du kannst werden, was du willst. Hauptsache, du wirst glücklich. Matthias schien sich vor allem das Versprechen aus der ersten Hälfte gemerkt zu haben. Ich den zwingenden Unterton vom darauf folgenden, sagt Amber. Also, Ende Zitat. Um, so, this, this pressure that they both feel... Um, to, to be lucky, um, or at least Amber is translating his, it as, as pressure, and Matthias seems to enjoy uh, the promise. Yes, yeah, as an opportunity, is. right? Yeah, yeah. Opportunity. They have a, they That's have a different yeah they have a different view on what that phrase means, and I, I think um, uh, yeah, I'm from 1983, but it means that I was seven in 1990, uh, and I was 18 when the twin towers came down. So the um, I, I see myself as a child of the of the '90s, uh, as in I was growing up during the '90s. I was I was uh, becoming a an adult during the '90s, um, and I think this generation, the generation that would now be between, let's say, 25 and, and 35, um, uh, in especially in the West, of course, has uh, has been raised with this idea of every house just being worth a little bit more than the year before and 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 you, you you can become anything and you can do anything just as long as you're happy because that was the thing literally that my my parents told me you can do anything um uh, uh, as long as you're happy 
and I, uh, I I thought it was I myself um, um, around me see my generation um, wrestling uh, with 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 those two things. Is it the opportunity to just uh, being able to become anything, or is it the pressure of being lucky or 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 or, or, or having to find luck? Um, uh, and 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 if that doesn't happen, is it is it your fault or not? And is it easier to to be a writer in in these a bit more complicated times than the ones you and we both grew, grew up in so far um, than it has been before in terms of this struggling um, in order to find your place in a in a rather complicated world? I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I just have the one, <laughs> I just have the one writer's life that I live, that I live. So, um, I, I don't, I don't know if it's any harder or not. Um, but I do think there's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I just come back to that. There's the two ways of, of looking at it. The opportunity to just become, being able to become anything you want or the pressure of, of, of having to become the best of yourself. Or what I actually mean is maybe also um, uh, reflecting on this combination of journalism and, and novel writing as we started the conversation with, uh, in a time as we live in now that is rather uncertain, um, mm -hmm. is it difficult to find the rest, the peace of mind to write a novel whilst you have mm. maybe this journalistic urge to really relate to what's happening around you? Right, yeah, you mean right now this year and the last couple of months, yeah. Um, it is, it is, it has been a struggle just, um, practically also because we're all holed up in our houses, maybe now a little bit less than, than, than a month ago or two months ago, but it's still not, uh, not ideal, far from ideal. Um, we would be together in Berlin right now if it wasn't for the coronavirus. So, 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 so it, it, it stole from us also, uh, we, um, uh, we as a newspaper, of course, are working our asses off right now, just delivering a paper when when, when like 90% of the people making the newspaper, and I'm sure the same goes for, for German newspapers, are working from home. The, the, the editors are working from home, of course. Um, there are still uh, people going to the streets to, to pick up stories, to talk to people, but but there are a lot of people are walk, working from home, not seeing their colleagues. All the while, there is all the more news to cover. So, um, uh, to answer your question, I was, I was trying, I was planning on writing another novel this summer. Uh, I would have started on in, in, uh, in the mid of April and, uh, and I was, I was going to write for three or four months, but I, 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 um, I put that off. I'm, I'm, I'm going to doing, I'm going to do that next year, uh, because of, um, I was not able to write the story that I wanted right now, because I think as a writer, writing on a novel and taking this deep dive into kind of this rabbit hole you have to go away from your regular work and you have to go away from checking the news very often which is which is kind of um hard right now you, you want to be uh, engaged with the news at times and um uh and also i wanted to write outside i wanted to go outside i wanted to write uh, on long train rides which is all not really an option right now so um, and the third thing is, um, uh, yes, I feel this urge also to to be around the news and to be at the, at the front lines of uh, of uh, of doing this and of, of of covering it and of helping my colleagues make a newspaper every day. So that would be that, that's my priority at this at this moment. And then and then the next novel it uh, it will find its way. But you said you already made a plan for this summer to yeah. start writing. So I would be curious, uh, are you really changing the plan heavily now? Or is it going to be a total different novel than it would have been uh, pre-corona? No, no, it's not, not totally no, no, no. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to write a book about the coronavirus. Um, I think right now it should have to take place in a world that has sustained the coronavirus as it will be published in 2021 or 22. Um, and I want to, I want to write a contemporary uh, novel. Um, but 99% of my idea is still the same. 
and I'm just going to uh, to to have to fit this into the puzzle as <laughs> as I did with some other aspects in uh, in Amatias. I'm, I'm just gonna make another puzzle and uh, and um, not as many characters. I know that I'm not gonna write from as many uh, point of views points of view as I did with Nachmatias, but. Uh, uh, but it's it's going to be a whole nother uh, challenge. Uh, but no, I'm not I'm not I'm not running a Corona novel. Peter, I want to thank you very much for this conversation, for being with me, um, not in Berlin, but um, you in Utrecht, me being in Amsterdam. Um, and actually, for the audience, I would just um, like to end with a very nice quote from the absolutely moving book Nach Matthias Na Matthias in. Dutch, um, and I'll read it to you in German. It's a quote from Quentin, Matthias' best friend. Und dann werden wir anstoßen. Einfach so auf die Selbstverständlichkeit eines Tages, der anfängt und wieder zu Ende geht. Thank you very much for being with us, Peter. Vielen Dank fürs Zuschauen. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you very much.